Excellencies, ministers, distinguished officials from the multilateral agencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to this fourth session of the Global Small Island Developing States Leaders, also known as SIDS. My name's Juliette Foster. And over the next 90 minutes, I'll be guiding you through what I'm sure will be a thought provoking and fascinating discussion. The theme of which is Seeds for All, Hunger for None, enhancing African seed systems to benefit small island developing states. A big subject indeed. The organizers of the Global Cities Leaders are also extremely grateful for the kind sponsorship of Bayer in supporting these debates at transnational level. So thank you so much for that support. Now, let's go into the past to take a look at the genesis of this debate. It goes all the way back to 1996, the year of the UN World Food Summit, and that declaration which underlined that universal food security can only exist when everyone has permanent physical and economic access to safe, nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and preferences. An ambition that was set to be reached by 2015 and which was further enshrined in the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. Now, the ambition of the Sustainable Development Goal number two is very specific because it focuses on ending hunger, achieving food security and improving nutrition, as well as promoting sustainable farming. But whilst zero hunger is a universally accepted aspiration, it is fair to say that time is running out. Sub-Saharan Africa is not on track to meet its target of eradicating all forms of hunger and malnutrition by 2030. The numbers really speak for themselves. Let's take a look at the most recent estimates from 2019, which reports that almost 690 million people, and we're talking here about nearly 9% of the global population, remain undernourished. Now, for small island developing states like the Sub-Saharan African mainland, numbers like this really bring into focus their severe vulnerabilities and food security risks. And of course, it is a situation that has been accentuated by two other key factors, namely climate change and, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic, all of which begs the questions, how do you reverse these dangers? Well, fostering increased access to nutritious food via plant-based innovations, allowing farmers to access new varieties of high-quality climate-adaptive seeds, well, that is one solution. But rolling out these techniques requires cultivation on a scale that is both affordable and manageable. Again, climate change, which I referred to earlier, has an impact with its unpredictable weather patterns, and it challenges both existing cultivation season cycles and, of course, the knowledge of local indigenous farmers. But as this debate will demonstrate, solutions that were pioneered in Africa could be adapted to the particular topographical characteristics and soil compositions of small islands. Mobile technologies, for instance, along with remote sensing services and distributed computing are improving the access of smallholder farmers to information, techniques and markets. But how far can they go in tackling these challenges in addition to existing economic and capacity limitations already faced by vulnerable nations? And what about the cost? It's all very well to talk about technology, but who should foot the bill for installing these new innovations? And the question must also be asked, is it possible to design climate smart seed policies that are sensitive to different soil compositions and farming systems and which at the same time are capable of delivering socially fair and beneficial outcomes to vulnerable communities such as those in small island states? So there's plenty for us to consider and they're just some of the issues that will be examined by our distinguished panel of experts. Let me give you what, an idea of what's going to happen. Each panellist will give a five minute speech Although having said that, there is room for a little bit of leeway on that. And afterwards, or rather during these speeches, they're going to outline their particular position and after which I will ask them a question. And then, of course, we will come to a more general selection of questions at the end of this first set. So, so much is happening, plenty of ground to cover all of that for later. But let's focus now by hearing some opening words of welcome from His Excellency David Doyle. Now, he is the ambassador of St. Kitts and Nevis to UNESCO. He's also the co-founding partner with Ambassador Jean-Paul Cacajon of the Solomon Islands of the GSL Initiative. Thank you, Julius. Excellencies, distinguished um, speakers, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to this Global SIDS Leaders uh, event devoted to SIDS for all 
hunger for none, and perhaps importantly, its implications for small island developing states known under the acronym of SIDS. Now, this is the fourth such event, bringing together leading experts from the UN family of organizations across the globe, uh, multilateral and bilateral donors and countries, prominent research institutions, and of course, ministers from the small islands themselves to debate critical strategic issues of importance to the future sustainability of small island developing states. The genesis of this um, Global SIDS Leaders uh, Initiative was driven by the need in a very uh, increasingly multipolar world to raise the profile of small island developing states on the international agenda. The objective is to secure a better understanding of the small islands uh, specific challenges, build mutual support at key transnational and regional negotiations, whether it's addressing the destructive nature of climate change or combating the spread of COVID, managing indebtedness, or as the topic of today's uh, uh, event uh, explores, developing innovative agricultural technologies to meet the particular needs of small island developing states. Now, small island developing states represent something like 38 independent sovereign uh, states across, scattered indeed across the globe, from the Caribbean to the Atlantic Ocean, from the Pacific to the Indian Ocean, representing 20% of the uh, UN membership. Now, while as we are very proud of the fact we have 20% of the UN membership, or one-fifth, if you like, SID's remoteness, size, limited and uh, institutional capacity sometimes results in many of these islands, if not all of them, facing particular challenges in getting their collective voices heard at bilateral and multilateral level uh, discussions. It was with this ambition, ambition in mind that uh, my uh, partner in this uh, particular initiative, Ambassador Jean-Paul Carteron of the Solomon Islands, we instigated the Global SIDS Leaders Initiative to give a more assertive voice to SIDS at transnational level. Ultimately, it's through important and timely debates of this nature, such as today, um, on the development of new seeds technology being pioneered in Africa with potential for small island developing states that we seek to inscribe uh, the small island strengths, opportunities, risks and weaknesses on the global development uh, agenda and also allow SIDS to become essentially an integral part also of identifying the solutions. So without further ado, uh, let me just also underline our deep appreciation to the sponsor of this event, Bayer, and I wish you all an enjoyable debate. Thank you. Ambassador Doyle, thank you for those words. Let's welcome our next speaker, who is the Agronomist and Secretary General of the African Seed Trade Association, Justin Rakatuarisi. You have five minutes. It's very good to see you, by the way. And the floor is now yours. Thank you. Thank you, Juliet. Uh, good afternoon, everyone from Nairobi. And uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this uh, meeting as a panelist. Uh, we, you will hear uh, the voice of the private seed sector because AFTA is uh, uh, representing the uh, private sector in Africa. So uh, I would like to talk about the constraints and the opportunity of uh, the private sector or the seed sector in general, so that we know or we understand why we would be uh, like this, I mean, the situation. So I would put it into categories for the constraint. Uh, the first one is the technical constraint and the second one is socioeconomic constraints. So what are the uh, technical constraints? Uh, uh, let me start with saying that uh, the public sector, sector is not able to play well its role for various reasons, such as lack of uh, seed infrastructure and uh, insufficiency of a skillful seed technician to carry out seed quality control. Uh, and uh, uh, they are not uh, able to implement the harmonized regional seed regulations. There's also absence of plant variety protection systems in some countries and difficulty for its implementation where they exist, where this is very important for us. And uh, most countries have a weak plant genetic resources exchange network with a lengthy variety release process. 
There is also limited development of new varieties, and this does not allow the African sector to keep pace with the rapid change in the global seed industry. Uh, for economic, uh, socioeconomic constraint, uh, the seed market size is too small, and this does not allow to justify significant, significant investment in the sector for a better seed trade. And uh, absence of reliable statistics on the African seed sector, which allows a good planning. This is uh, tremendously uh, lacking in Africa, despite the fact that we try to address it through our National Seed Trade Association. There's also difficulty of accessing to capital for small and medium private seed sector companies actually to develop and improve their operation, whereas they play an active role and an important one to uh, serve the farmer in a niche region. There's also a distortion of the seed market due to poorly managed seed subsidies and undermining the private seed industry because we have planned production and all of a sudden there's a seed coming from nowhere and it's not sold from the formal. Then there's also a difficulty for accessing to credit to uh, procure agricultural input, including seed for small farmers who are still the majority of farmers in the continent. Those are the constraints and what are the opportunity because uh, opportunity do exist. There are uh, continuous efforts for the effective implementation of the harmonized seed regulation by the regional economic communities, ECOWAS, COMESA, SADEC, and DIC, and the African Union with this uh, relatively new African continental free trade area and all of those will increase the size of the seed market. And we have uh, after a good cooperation with all of those uh, organizations and we thank them for accepting us to give our idea from time to time in their document. There's also the availability of the seed technology to accelerate the research to develop better variety in order to meet the need of diversified agroecological zones in the continent. We do need because our continent has many, many agroecological zones and uh, very diversified. There is also on, uh, ongoing public-private partnership, such as licensing of variety from the narrow National Agricultural Research Organization, and instead of remaining with the self, with the public, because they are not uh, uh, able to uh, take it to farmer, uh, they are doing this licensing. There is also uh, the fact that development partners or donors are still interested in African seed sector development in various uh, forms. And uh, there's a continued effort by international and regional organizations such as WIPOV, WAPEI, ARIPO, to promote plant variety protection in Africa to motivate the breeding. We know very well that the budget allocated to the breeding or to the research becomes less and less from the public sector. And we need the private sector to take over uh, for this uh, breeding. And the last uh, but not uh, least, uh, the existence of the, of the seed trade association at national, at, national, at regional, and uh, even the global level, because uh, they, they allow the private seed sector to discuss among themselves about issues within the seed industry and advocate for an enabling environment in which they can operate more efficiently to avail quality seed to farmer, which is the ultimate goal. Uh, the fact remains that uh, there is high seed demand in Africa, but it's not solvable, meaning they are not backed up by uh, processing power. And uh, we heard uh, from FIO that uh, it's 30% in Africa, the adoption rate of formal seed. But uh, I think we need to categorize because for some crop, it's already very high, such as maize, because th this is a staple food. And... Uh, there is a challenge to avail quality seed to farmers in the continent because seed demand is derived demand, meaning if the produce is not attractive and used by the, the consumer, there's no motivation to spend money to buy quality seed and other agricultural input improve production. Indeed, the experience shows that where there is commercial outlet for the produce, the adoption of high quality seed and other technical technology is higher. There is a need, therefore, to coordinate and support the entire value chain, right from the research and development to the produce, to the produce market output. 
because if we uh, focus only on seed as such, we will lose this uh, um, uh, derivability from uh, the uh, price of the produce. Then uh, I would like to end uh, my uh, speech uh, by saying that it's gratifying though that the continent has potential to grow and improve uh, its agriculture in general and the seed sector in particular with around 60% of the Arab land in the world in Africa. So uh, thank you for listening and uh, again, uh, we wish, uh, we, we do hope that uh, despite of uh, the problem or the challenges in uh, Africa mainland and the uh, uh, small island developing, uh, developing uh, states, we are still hopeful that uh, we will be able to do something for its improvement for the food security of the fast growing population. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Justin. I want to, uh, there's a lot there in what you said. There's one particular thing which really stood out for me, and that's the size of, of, of the seeds sector. Does that largely underpin one of the reasons why, even though we have seen a great deal of work in developing seeds that are resistant to severe climate change, the technology that's gone into this, etc., that this is perhaps one of the reasons, the size of the sector, that we haven't seen this big rollout of that technology, the adoption of what it has produced, because clearly this is an issue. The SIDS, the sub-Saharan African countries, they are working together, but it does appear from what you've said as if combined with everything else, it comes down to the size of the sector. In other words, how, if, it's a, if it's a large sector, it can exert clout, things can be done more quickly. Okay, thank you. They say this is one, but I would say that uh, in my opinion, there are two main reasons why it's like this. The first one is the affordability of, uh, of the seed. Uh, that means it's relatively uh, expensive for the substance farmer and uh, who, as we know, mainly uh, grow for their consumption only and they can't afford uh, to, to buy the good seed then. And two, the, the availability of seed at the right time and at the right place for farmers. Because uh, if we don't have enough uh, dealer network, uh, it will be difficult for uh, uh, seed to, to, to reach to, to, to the farmers. And also sometimes there is a, like a social uh, resistance to the technology, like a plant breeding innovation, genetically modified uh, uh, crop and so on. So uh, these uh, points uh, I've just mentioned, in my opinion, uh, contribute to the fact that uh, there is technology, there is quality seed, private sector is ready to produce seed but uh, with this uh, non-affordability and uh, non-availability with uh, social resistance to some technology, this is, in my opinion, the reason why it's not really going on well. OK, then, Justin, thank you so much for that. So thank you so much for those of you who have taken part in today's discussion. We appreciate your contribution and we look forward to seeing you, well, hearing from you again in the not do too distant future. Because remember, the small island developing states this is their time. Their voices are being heard. It's time for all of us to listen and to work together. Thank you.